Hi, and welcome to the show. Today, we're gonna to take a look at some communities that have come together to make positive change. These improvements include adding art, flowers, plants, and gardens to their city. Take Brightside St. Louis, for instance. Their volunteers come together to focus on ways in which to improve their community by making it greener and cleaner. Check that out. This is the center of South St. Louis. The hill is right down the street, and uh, it, it's a very unusual place to have a garden like this. Brightside has been around for 35 years, and we've always been a cleanup and beautification program. And we thought it was important as we're trying to clean up St. Louis and beautify St. Louis that we wanted people to have a place where they could come and learn about things they could do in their own community. If you have dry, rocky soil on the vacant lot in your neighborhood, Glade plants are the perfect plants for those. You don't have to try and change the soil. You're working with the landscape you have. We have a program that provides plant material and tools for people who want to improve the public spaces in their neighborhood. And so if they come to the demonstration garden, they can learn about Missouri native plants and what are the natural places where these types of plants would be growing. Anytime you can turn something that's nothing into something that would invite wildlife, migratory birds, enhance their, their way north and south, then it should be done. My name is Elizabeth Ward. I'm the Monarch Conservation Coordinator here at Brightside St. Louis. The original goal for Milkweeds for Monarchs was to create 250 gardens within the city of St. Louis. We're currently over 350 and nearing 400 gardens. The monarch butterfly is kind of a special species. Most people, you know, when they were growing up, they, they knew about the monarch, and we've seen that the population has drastically declined, and so we've kind of used the monarch as kind of the poster child of the pollinator species. We require at least four milkweed plants. This plant is really important for them because it's the only plant that the uh, female butterfly will lay her eggs on and the only plant that the caterpillar will eat. We require that you have at least five native nectar source plants. Really anything that's native and that flowers and that thrives in you know, whatever environment that you're living in is a good plant to also plant for the monarchs or for other pollinators. When we create habitat for monarchs, we're also creating habitat for other pollinators as well. We also demonstrate sustainable and other conservation practices. One of them is uh, a filter pave, which has recycled glass in mixed in with rock and so what happens when it rains all of the water stays on site instead of runs off into the storm sewers and that's really important in, in especially in an urban area because quite often you know our sewers get overcharged and so that's all getting carried into our rivers and our streams stormwater picks up litter and and oil and other pollutants that are on the streets. They don't call it the muddy Mississippi for no reason. <laughs> so you need to start recycling all of your glass so that everybody has paths like this. One day I was here and there was a little girl from down the street who saw a butterfly and she was just so excited. She went running back, mama, 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 I saw a butterfly. It was awesome. And in the urban areas, sometimes we just don't have that connection like we need. I encourage any community who's interested in, in making the people around them, you know, happy and improving the quality of life, green space does that. And that's why it's important to benefit the pollinators, to benefit the people. And a demonstration garden like this can do just that. Whether it's a, a big corner of, of a city or whether it's a vacant lot, it really is about connecting people with nature. And that's what makes a difference for all of us. See how a group of volunteers are making their community more visually appealing when we return.
Hey, take a look at these geraniums and bacopa spilling out of this window box we just planted. We all know that flowers can really transform a space. The color they add just brings joy to our world. For over 30 years, volunteers in University City, Missouri have been enhancing their neighborhoods and community by planting flowers and maintaining gardens in their public spaces and the results, well, they're just beautiful. University City in Bloom is an organization that wants to keep University City beautiful. We do all the public gardens around City Hall, around this building, which is the rec center. We do the gardens around all the schools just to make them friendly and welcoming. It makes everybody in a better mood. It makes it beautiful. Everybody loves it. People love flowers. They love seeing beautiful flowers. It makes them feel good. They're always saying, can you tell us what's planted in such and such a garden? And uh, they're always saying, I want my yard to look like this. First got involved in horticulture, uh, going to school as an art student. When I discovered that I could design with plants and still use color, form, texture, I switched majors pretty quickly and became uh, a designer and horticulturist. Every year we, you know, we, we plant something different. We've had a lot of luck with grasses as just being a focal point, um, elephant ears. Um, this year we're using papyrus. Another plant that I've been using lately, um, it's Alternanthera Little Ruby. I absolutely love this plant. It fills out really nice, great purple color. Right now, currently, there are seven planters located next to seven bus shelters. I was talking to a woman this morning waiting for the bus and she said, you know, I just love sitting here. Uh, it's so pleasant. It just seemed to make that shelter more inviting to, to the people who take the buses. And I've noticed that uh, that's kind of catching on. People are doing a better job in that the trash cans are full instead of the, the bench and the ground. Our mission is to enhance and beautify our community. So, you know, we're specifically looking for some of these areas. It's like, how can we make this better? What can we fix? If, if you drive up and down Olive Boulevard, which is one of, one of the harshest areas, there's, there's a number of vacant lots. We have about nine gardens on Olive that uh, we're, we fund through a special tax district, and we're able to maintain and beautify some, some pretty interesting vacant spots on Olive Boulevard, and then a number of gardens throughout our city, even in some of the neighborhoods, are empty areas that would otherwise just be that, you know, weed trees and things like that. And so when people see this beautification, I mean, it uplifts the whole community immediately. People, so often when they move into town, and they, they see those gardens and they say, ooh, somebody cares. It helps bring people and businesses into the city and it helps keep them here. Um, it enhances their, their neighborhoods, it brings up property values, uh, reduces crime, there's so many um, effects of it. When Jesse put the last batch of planters out, we heard from a couple of businesses who said, can you put one in front of ours? I've uh, kind of fallen into a great niche here at U City in Bloom, providing a community with fantastic beauty that makes them really feel like we're doing something for them. After the break, world-renowned artists use a historic downtown as a canvas for their art. You don't want to miss this. Don't you just love art? It can be so inspiring. It's not just confined to a home or a museum or even a studio. The Unexpected, an urban art project, brings murals and street art to downtown Fort Smith. My name is Claire Kohlberg and I'm the director of The Unexpected. And The Unexpected is produced by a nonprofit uh, called 646 Downtown, which was founded by Steve Clark. 
Steve, what is 646 downtown? That's a great question. So 646 downtown is a charitable organization that we founded to focus on the downtown area of Fort Smith to create vibrant experiences, opportunities for our citizens uh, to affect our local economy and our region and our state. How did you get the support from the community that you needed to get this public art display launched? We were thinking in terms of economic development. Mm. We were also thinking in terms of, regardless of how you think we got here as a species, mm -hmm. it's clear that we were built to respond to things of order, design, and beauty. I mean, the changes that have happened with the Unexpected Project have been huge for the downtown area. Uh, it's rejuvenated some of the older buildings that we've had uh, and just given them new life. We were very thoughtful about bringing world-class urban and contemporary artists because it was not just about bringing high-quality art, but it was also about um, challenging perceptions, not just the perceptions that people have of Arkansas um, globally, but also the perceptions that Arkansas and Fort Smith have of itself. Being Fort Smith natives and, and moving back 20 years later, it was pretty exciting to see such vibrant colors, great paintings, uh, fantastic murals, uh, installations. It ignited us to want to be in this area and live in this environment. So one of the inspirational things that occurred as a result of the Crystal Bridges Museum in Northwest Arkansas was clearly a conversation that's now beginning to occur about art in Arkansas, not just Northwest Arkansas. In Fort Smith, we're never gonna build, build a world-class museum like they have in Bentonville, but we can make this our own. We can make Fort Smith's version of that. We can make world-class art available to everyone uh, as a normal part of their day, which has reintroduced our citizens to a very integral part of our city, which is our historic downtown. A lot of people will come by and they want to take photos of the murals, you know, so they, they hop around to each one downtown. And so I'll see people out there, you know, doing selfies and it's just kind of starting to become vibrant and kind of a uh, heartbeat of the city again. Tell me about the future. Are there more sides of buildings like this one that we'll see art on? What it's done is it's led to other people being involved, bringing their ideas. And so they'll continue to be murals, but they'll also be now sculpture. And we've seen our local art economy uh, grow dramatically with, with local art shows and engagements of that nature. And so uh, it's been exciting to see from this little Petri dish Mm -hmm. you know, that right. we set in motion what has grown yeah. uh, from it, which is exactly what we hoped it would do. I've got the perfect garden tips for some of your feline family members, so stick around. I'm at my friend Jess's house, and I think her cats, Charlotte and Raleigh, are gonna love what I brought them today. Well, there you go, Jess, what do you think? Alan, I love this. I what? assume you put it together. Oh, I did, it was really easy and it didn't take any time at all. I did it this morning. Awesome. Yeah, it's gonna grow and fill in and the cats are gonna love it. You just start with any container you like, something that works with your decor, and be sure to use a soil that's specifically made for containers. Drop in your plants and you're good to go. Just make sure the plant is getting plenty of sun and has well-drained soil. And I would feed these about once a month. Now, Jess, another plant that your adorable kitties will love is cat grass. Really? Oh, yeah. They'll be all in it. Alan, Charlotte really loves it. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, you're so welcome. Now, Charlotte, you need to tell your brother, Raleigh, that there's some catnip out here for you to play with. Coming up, can you imagine moving a farm? Big Tech's Urban Farms near Dallas makes it look easy. The idea of a farm can be expressed in many ways. For instance, take the Big Tech's Urban Farm near Dallas. This is a farm that can, well, be moved at the drop of a hat. A cowboy hat, that is.
every aspect of the Big Tech's urban farm system is mobile. Why is it mobile? Well, we throw the biggest fair in the United States here every September and October. So the space that we're sitting on right now actually turns into concession stands and shopping opportunities uh, for our 2.4 million guests that come each year. I'm Drew Dimmler. I'm the greenhouse manager for the Great State Fair of Texas. We are in a USDA certified food desert here in South Dallas. Um, there are very few grocery store options. It's something that we've been aware of for a while now and uh, one of the main reasons that we wanted to start the urban farm here. Basically I was looking at underutilized space here and uh, you know had this wild idea maybe we could grow vegetables on concrete. It's a heck of a process. We have 520 mobile planters that we use to grow produce, which we donate to the South Dallas community through a couple of different local organizations. And we put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into building these things. Each box is 40 by 48 inches. We build with this collar system. It's a custom-made collar that's seven and a half inches deep, and it sits right on top of a pallet. The pallet is what makes it mobile. Then we fill it with a, uh, a garden blend, a garden soil, so that it drains properly. So these are basically just by 40 by 48 inch containers that we're growing in. And that allows us to grow on this big open parking lot, which is only used during the state fair. Um, so literally, yeah, we are growing produce and concrete. So our harvest season started this year with radishes and they've come and gone already. Radishes are a rocket ride in the garden, man. They're fantastic. They, from seed to harvest time is about 40 days. So they are coming and going already. Next on the list were leeks and onions, and we are in the middle of harvest season on both of those. I expect that we'll tip the scales with well over a thousand by the time we're said and done. Shortly thereafter, we're gonna be digging potatoes. Next after that, I expect green beans, and then the summer stuff should start kicking in. So we've got squash, zucchini, peppers, like five different varieties of peppers. Okra, of course, a southern staple. Every garden's got to have okra, right? Black-eyed peas, purple holes, pintos. Last year, with only 100 boxes, we were able to donate over 6,000 fresh vegetables to the community. This year, we're, we've converted our measurements to pounds, and uh, we've just started the harvest season, and we've already harvested around 120, 130 pounds. Who knows what that number is going to be by, by the year end. Starting in August, we're going to have to move all 520 boxes. A lot of them will stay here on site and get used in various displays. The rest of them we're actually going to load up on a semi-truck and move around the community where other community groups are going to take care of them for us for a couple of months while we go under a rock for the state fair. We're pretty proud that we can move about three quarters of an acre uh, of growing space, you know, in, a, in a, about eight hours, so pretty neat. It's magic to see the kids come out here. A lot of them don't even realize what food is, what food they're looking at. You know, they'll see things like a pepper and think, man, we never knew that's where a pepper came from. We've never seen this before. So we're definitely opening some eyes with this project. The okra ain't half bad either. <laughs>Positive transformation can make such an amazing impact on a community. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith.